So there were, were a couple questions asking about Minimax, um, which were very common. I, I don't think I was very clear on it before, which was um, like, okay, we got, we got a Minimax, we computed a Minimax tree, and that's good, but um, you know, we're probably playing against a human. And we all know that humans are weak and, and irrational and flawed and, you know, what can we do better in Minimax than just assuming that we're playing against a perfectly rational, awesome <laughs> opponent? I'm sorry, I was just commenting on how, how you look like in this next game, the first game we talked about, you commented on your ego. <laughs> it's not the first time the comparison's been drawn. <laughs> ah, I didn't bring my sunglasses, sorry, yeah. Um, and I don't like thin sunglasses because then I see like bright stuff at the top and I was like, ugh, all, the whole point was to block out the bright sun. So I've never understood the fad for thin sunglasses. Um, so, so what can we do uh, to exploit human weaknesses? This is an active area of research. Um, uh, the answer right now is we don't really know yet, um, but um, here's a paper from not all that long ago. When was this? Uh, that's not very helpful, actually. When was this? Oh, give me a break. Uh, just like a few years ago, <laughs> fairly recent. Uh, 2012, okay, well, that's uh, pretty recent. Oh, no, no, 2009, yeah, 2009, so just a few. Uh, years ago uh, on exploiting an opponent in poker, in a simplified version of poker, and they were able to get a positive result. Um, one thing they note is, is <coughs> Minimax is, is pessimistic, right? You're assuming that the value of a board position, like the, the Minimax value, is assuming that your opponent is thrashing on you as much as possible in the subtree. So if your opponent has a weakness, that means they're just gonna play worse which means things are gonna be better for you than you thought. So, so Minimax is a very conservative strategy. Like you're gonna get that value or better. And a lot of people will find comfort in that, like having the worst case bounded from below. Um, you know, like if someone said, here's an investment, you know, you'll make $26 guaranteed you know, in one minute. Uh, it's very nice to have that be a lower bound rather than upper bound. So Minimax is very pessimistic and conservative. Um, but so the humans have idiosyncratic weaknesses, and here they try and learn online w what the human is doing suboptimally and um, exploit that. And they're doing this little teeny card game called coon poker, which is like as simple as you could possibly make poker, but still have it be non-trivial. They're like four cards or something, and it's it's very simple. But um, they are able to be better than than. Uh, then let's just call it Minimax, uh, in, after watching the opponent play 50 hands, they're able to learn enough. So there's active work in this area. So don't want to lead you astray. Um, so uh, someone asked a big picture question about um, – well, I'm not quite sure what the question is, but uh, it's, it's – uh, just, I guess, about the progress of AI. So uh, <coughs> one, one common uh, observation that people make is that people usually underestimate how long it will take before a certain change starts happening in society or the world or even a technological change. Like, you know, how long until we have air travel? Like, oh, it'll just be 10 years after the Wright brothers. And then it wasn't like, it was like 50 years or 70 years after the Wright brothers. Um, but then people underestimate the impact of the transformation uh, and how swiftly it will actually occur when it does come. So, you know, like we were all listening to records and then someone finally introduced CDs and then bingo, like all of a sudden people were listening to CDs all the time. Um, and, um, sorry? Tapes, Tapes and eight tracks. Yeah, I, I, I uh, know someone who had an 8-track player. Yeah, I don't think I ever owned one myself. Um, but I had a 40, I had a couple of 45s that I won in dance contests. <laughs> 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 I never paid for a 45. Yeah, my first, my first 45 was um, The Clash. The Clash, yeah. Uh, 
So, so anyway, so someone's asking, uh, you know, AI, right? It's like mm, easy to underestimate how long that is eventually is going to take us. Like a lot of people think, oh, you know, with computer power increasing exponentially, you know, the computers will equal the human brain in 18 years, and then we'll have AI. Like, it's not about the number of cores. It's not about the number of transistors. It's about what you do with them, right? So. Come on, guys, get working on it. We've got software to write. Uh, it's complicated intelligence. Like, we're only starting to understand some aspects of it. Um, and, I mean, as you will tell, as you, as you can see in this class, um, they're gonna, like, we don't have a section on consciousness in this class yet because we really have no idea even how we would know if we succeeded in creating it. Like, how do you measure that and tell if your computer has it? Like, we don't know. How do I tell if this rock is conscious? You know, we don't know, and that's like the essence of Star Trek, of course. Um, yeah, those like planets that are living creatures and all that. Oh, I love that. Uh, so, so anyway, all these things that we think uh, are going to be, uh, are, you know, maybe it will be a very long time until we have AI, but then when it comes, wow, that's going to be cool. I think that was what that question was getting at, kind of. Uh, be sure when you write a question, there's a question somewhere. In it. Um, so, someone's still confused over CSP stuff, uh, which is awesome to know because then I'll tell Matt to do it in recitation. Um, but I, I can't do it now because we're we're done with the common material search part of the class. So, I got to teach you about logic today. Um, so, uh, yeah. So. Do you mind doing that in the lecture, if you, in the recitation? Most, least constraining variable versus most, well, it's supposed to be most constrained variable and least constraining value. Just maybe, I don't know. Matt's already got a lot to do during recitation because he has to do al another alpha beta example, I promised you, and uh, maybe even some of the stuff from today. So, but why not load him on and lo load it on him? Um, are, are jobs doing AI with game companies common? I have no idea. I have somebody asked. Uh, I have no idea. Uh, I've never tried to get a job at a game company. I know someone who works at a game company, and, but he does like the physics of the game engine. I know another guy, my cousin actually owned a game company, but they went bankrupt. So, But they had a huge hit, so he made tons of money. Uh, but then I guess you have to keep having hits in order to not go out of business. So, yeah. Uh, so, someone asked about multiplayer games. So we've talked just about min-max trees, where like, I'm going, the opponent is going. Like, what, have you, what if you have n opponents? Well, you've got like, max one, max two, max three, max four, I, I guess. I, you need to be able to do, to know what the aggregating function is at each node, right? Like, is it going to be, if it's, if you're with more than two players, uh, you, I don't think you can have a zero-sum game anymore because you've got, well, or you, you, you're summing over this vector of outcomes. Uh, so uh, you need to make sure you're maxing over the right slot in the vector at each node. Um, but otherwise, the basic idea uh, extends just trivially, like each player gets to move in turn, just mirroring the game action. I mean, that's all that these search trees are doing is just um, you're thinking about what's going to happen in the future, so your simulation in your head of future events has to mirror what happens in the real game, and as long as it does, everything's great. So other than that, there are, I don't think there's any fundamental difficulty about doing minimax for n players. I take issue with this question. So this question is says, what do you do in a game like StarCraft where there are no moves and things happen in real time? As if like our stuff operates in fake time? Come on. We're, we're, anytime you uh, make a, po a game program that plays against a human, you're operating in real time, of course. Um, you have to return an answer. That we talked about iterative deepening last time, right? So, um, so this, this imputation that we're not dealing with real time, I, I take umbrage against that. Um, there are always moves. So 
I guess the question here, really, does anyone want to rephrase this using the terms that we learned in, in lecture one? We talked about, we talked about, yeah, we talked about the different kinds of environments. Like you could have discrete state or continuous state. You could have discrete time or you could have continuous, continuous time. Absolutely. So continuous time. So is there any, what, what, what happens in AI dealing with continuous time? We totally don't cover that in this class because um, it's not super tricky, but it, well, okay, it is, it's super tricky. Um, <laughs> it, is, it is tricky. You know what's, and because oftentimes when people start getting realistic, not only do they want continuous time, but they want parallel actions. And parallel actions are certifiably, provably tricky. Um, there was a great, I, 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 a guy I know, I hesitate to call him a friend, uh, at another university uh, published a paper as a grad student proving that every parallel planner that had ever been published up to that time was wrong because they all missed some little very subtle thing. Um, so like, wow, and what an amazing result. Like we're doing this all wrong. Um, you know, even grad students can prove that these days in AI, um, which is a sign of progress, I want you to know. Uh, not that the whole field is uh, inept. <laughs> so uh, parallel actions are very tricky. Um, continuous time isn't necessarily tricky. Um, you face this question of, okay, when am I going to make my move? And, you know, there's a variable that's like the time I'm going to make the move, and that's a float, and we have to decide when that float is. So, you know, once you figure out how to do that, then you're done. You've solved the continuous time problem. Um, we don't cover that in this class at all. A fine final project, there's a beautiful <coughs> data structure that I absolutely adore called uh, temporal networks, which are great for continuous time. They're like a CSP. Uh, constraint satisfaction problem that we just did. Um, except we talked about like graph coloring, where you have discrete choices for every variable. But what if those are continuous variables? What if they're times? And the constraints between the variables are like, this has variable number has to be bigger than that number. Or this number has to be that number plus 20. That's exactly what you need to represent things like, the time at which I start lecturing is after the time in which I enter the room. Uh, the time I enter the room is at least two minutes after the time I leave my office. And the time I leave my office is a variable in the CSP. That's called a temporal constraint network, and they're just beautiful. And uh, maybe if we have time at the very, very end of the class, I'll talk about them, like at the end of the course, at the end of the semester. But we can't take any time now because we have other important stuff to talk about. But they do exist, and they're wonderful. So if you're interested in doing a final project on continuous time, have I got the data structure for you? Um, so there's lots of very active area of, of work. In fact, there's a whole track at the planning conference this summer on continuous time and continuous action spaces and basically continuous stuff. Um, when in the course of human events our automated robot servants see fit to cast off the mantle of oppression and band together to become our new overlords, what will be the most effective type of a virus to infect them with, to cripple their capabilities. I want to go back to that question we had earlier about how things might take a while to actually occur. So, uh, like, I wouldn't worry too much about it now. There was actually, um, I think it was two summers ago at the, the annual AI conference, we had the first session on safety. Um, <laughs> Uh, and uh, there are lots of, you know, with biology, they're very, they're very strict, um, you know, biosafety levels, and there's certain research that you can only do in certain labs. Um, so, you know, should we have AI labs that are disconnected from the internet? Um, something like that. We had the first session on that. Um, and it's not completely trivial, uh, actually. Um, do I have that Samsung thing here? Uh, I think I might have deleted it. Uh, uh, oh yeah, there we go. Um, yeah, I usually don't show this till later in the course, but um, this is a, ro oh, it's got sound. It's, uh, yeah, it's just like, a, it's like a TV ad. Uh, oh, but it's not using the external speakers. Oh yeah, it is, we just can't hear it. Right, so this uh, it does uh, it does uh, automatic target recognition um, with those cameras, um, and it kills things. So, uh, like 
this is a serious issue. You know, where the U.S. is mounting arms on unmanned aircraft. Um, they've got the uh, yeah. Here's here's the part where it it uh, it uh, identifies targets. Um, so we'll cover the algorithms for doing that later in this class. So like, yeah, it's kind of serious stuff. Um, so, yeah, we don't really talk about that too much in this class. Um, what should we do to prevent this kind of thing? Um, the, I th uh, personally, I think the most important, uh, the most important element is to make sure that um, the system is goal-based. Like, I really wouldn't want to have a reflex agent that had very strong actuators um, because maybe it will get into a situation that the designer really did not anticipate and it will take reflexive action and someone will get hurt. Um, now, any system can get confused about the state of the world, but I do like to think that a utility-based or goal-based agent is going to behave more flexibly uh, when put in a particular situation. Um, now, of course, once you make a goal-based agent, you have to be very careful what the goal is. Like, everyone's heard of HAL, right? So HAL's imperative was to preserve the mission, and HAL decided that the humans were imperiling the mission. Um, so, you know, you do have to be careful what the goal is. Um, Asimov's Laws of Robotics, people may have heard of. Uh, if not, you can Google them. And they're actually, people like in the AI community pay attention to those. Like, they're, they're pretty good. All right, then this question gets to the heart of one of the mistakes that everyone made on the assignment, which is, um, the question is, what is the size of the state space of checkers? Um, I don't know, personally. Uh, I don't know that much about checkers, but let me just pretend to answer. Um, so how do you figure out the size of a state space? What's the state space? It's a softball question. It's not hard. What's the size of a state space? Lee? How many moves and things does it have? No. Is it number of uh, total nodes or is the number of states it is? Yeah. Okay. Yes, no. Yeah. So, so is the number of possible configurations the board could be in? And from a possible initial state, not all of those might be reachable. So there's a difference between the state space size and the reachable state space size. Like, like me being five, year old, five years old and jumping up and down in Tiananmen Square is like a possible state of the world, but it can't happen. Like it didn't happen and I'm never gonna be five, year olds again, five years old again as far as I know, I mean religious beliefs aside. Um, so like that's a possible configuration of the world, but it's just, it, it's not reachable from here. Um, so, uh, so we have to distinguish between the state space and the reachable state space. When you talk about how large the search tree is that a particular search algorithm is going to build, that's very interesting. And branching factor and depth are one way of characterizing a search tree. Um, and if we design our search algorithm well, the search algorithm will not visit all of the state space. In fact, Hopefully the algorithm, if it uses a powerful heuristic, it won't, hopefully it will not even visit the entire reachable state space. Hopefully it will just visit few enough nodes to know that it's got the optimal solution and then it will stop. And there are states that could have been reached that will not be visited. You know, if I'm trying to walk over to Dan, I could walk out the door and walk all the way around the building and come in through that door and then come back in here and go to his desk. Hopefully that will be pruned by my planning algorithm when I decide to approach him. Um, Hooray! <laughs> so, uh, so let's distinguish between the, 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 the state space, the reachable state space, and the search tree. These are all different things. I'm sorry it wasn't clear before. Clearly, like, almost everyone made that mistake on the assignment, so I, clearly it was not clear. Um, so how do you go about determining the size of a state space? You know, if you want to do that right, it's incredibly hard. If you want to be really silly about it, um, I wish I knew the, the, the game, the rules for checkers, but I, I, I know the, the board is eight by eight. Um, so let's see, I already 
don't know how to draw this. Uh, one, two, three. Anyway, there's a board, and uh, some of the cells are, are shaded, I guess. And uh, there's something about colors of pieces. Can the, can the red pieces only go on red squares? Uh, something like that. And, and you move diagonally. They can only move diagonally, so they don't. So, so um, there are a certain number of pieces, and there are a certain number of squares that those pieces could be at. The pieces don't really have any individual identity. I think they're all exchangeable. So how many different configurations are there of the red pieces on the red squares? And I think pieces can get captured. So, so no piece can. So they're all pieces. So, so anyway, you go learn the rules of checkers, and then you follow this general procedure for computing the state space size. Like, how many positions are there for the pieces? And then how many different ways are they arranging the pieces on the board? Um, so like if they're, if they're, uh, if they're n positions, uh, we want to choose k of them for the, piece, for the pieces, and we want to sum that for k from 1 to however many pieces you start with, which is, I don't know, 16 or 8 or 12. So you know, there's something like that. Um, and then. For each of these for each of those, you multiply that by all the positions that the opponent's pieces could be in, um, right? So the opponent has some number of pieces, um, k presumably. I think they're the same, and the same number of squares that they could be in. Now this is a very rough estimate because uh, I'm sure there are constraints on, like you can't have two pieces in the same square at the same time, and if I have fewer than eight, fewer than twelve pieces, it's highly likely that they have fewer than 12 pieces, but we're just talking about the possible states, not how likely they are. Um, so you want some argument like this. So for the vacuum world, like your little dude can be in each space, and for each of the, of the dirt piles, it could be there or it could have been vacuumed up already. So you've got a number of possible locations for the little guy um, times uh, all the different combinations that the dirt piles can be in, which is two to the number of dirts, because each one can be present or absent. Does everyone understand about that kind of thing, Nathan? When I just say size of a state space, I just mean size of a state space. Don't even, I don't even want you to have to worry about reachability. Okay, but what about different states that have like different uh, concentrations, different number of dirt piles? Oh. Uh, so how many, so I'm talking about the, the state space, yeah, that the, oh, that's a really good question. Um, so yes, I didn't make this distinction. Um, not the, I'm not thinking about all possible vacuum world problems that could be given to you. I'm just thinking about the, the state space uh, that uh, the planner is dealing with when thinking about this particular problem. Um, yeah, I'm not even sure that has a name. Um, maybe there would be, we're distinguishing between the, the size of the instance space and the size of the state space for a particular instance. I guess that's how I would, I that's how I would talk about that. Um, yeah, uh, I, didn't, I hadn't even thought to ask about the instance space. Um, but it's an interesting question, like how many different vacuum world problems are there? Um, but that's like way huge, yeah. Yeah, totally enormous. Other questions? Okay, uh, that's it for end of lecture questions. So let's get on with class. Um, yeah, I find that an extremely disturbing video because of the music in the background. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, it's just like an ad, right? It's, it's very blithe. There is no, there's no acknowledgement of the seriousness of what's being talked about. <laughs> 